Uh, we'd like to welcome everyone to uh, Afflington Parkersburg High School, uh, our first ever Ed Thomas Family Foundation High School Leadership Academy. Uh, we're definitely honored to have each and every one of your schools here with us and, and going through the list. We have a great group. My name's Aaron Thomas. Um, I'm the oldest son uh, of Ed Thomas, the, the, the guy who I guess our foundation was started after he was a longtime high school teacher and coach here at Afflington Parker. Um, we went through a tornado in EF5, or an EF5 tornado in 2008, and then in 2009 my, my father was uh, murdered here in our high school weight room at the time it was down at that bus barn. And so uh, four NFL guys at the time, Casey Wigman was our first NFL guy from here, and then another guy who lived down in Texas, a former student, and they came to our family and said, hey, we want to continue what Coach stood for and what Coach was about. So that's how we started the Ed Thomas Family Foundation. And we can't thank you guys enough for being here today. I'm going to go through a couple house cleaning, keeping stuff, and, and make sure everybody's on the fa same page with that. Um, number one, some of this stuff at first is going to be more for the advisors. If you'll make sure you check what lunch shift you're eating. we got the two lunch shifts. It is primarily alphabetical. We ask that you make sure you eat with your whole group at that time, um, just so our numbers match up on that. Also, we had we were going to cap it at 450. We ended up with about, our, ended up with probably... 490 to 495 people in here today. So we ask you take one lunch because we don't have a whole lot of extras. Fellas, if you're hungry, find the gals who aren't eating everything, ask them politely, maybe they'll borrow you theirs. Okay? The other thing with that, if you have any extra notebooks or names in your sack as we were putting this together, any extras, um, we'll get those if, you, if you, we can get those from you when you're done here today with that. After every speaker, you're going to have a 10 minute break. Okay? So we have restrooms. When you first come out the auditorium and go down the hallway to your right by the gym, our locker rooms are down there. There's two men's, two women's. We also have the one small bathroom that is down by the practice gym where you had donuts. Okay, feel free to use all those. We do ask you stay out of the two areas. We have the wood doors closed down there. That's our academic wing. We're still having school here at AP. Um, so we ask that you stay out of those two areas for that. Um, also, we're, we, we have great sponsors who donated. We had the donuts today. Um, hi V's, your lunch today. We're going to have waters for you. We're going to have Gatorade out there. All we ask is that the only thing comes in here, you can have water. Okay, but we ask you don't bring in um, Gatorade or any food into our auditorium to help us keep that nice. And then finally, I need to thank our sponsors. Like I said, on the back of your shirts, you'll notice hi V uh, today. They sponsored each and every one of your guys' lunches. So we appreciate hi V for that. Also, Iowa Sports Supply out of Cedar Falls. They helped and discounted us from the t-shirts to the lanterns to all those different things. So we appreciate their involvement. They also purchased the drinks for you today from that end. Also, Mr. Alderts, our guy running the sound and doing the lights. And then two people you may not, well, Mr. Kearns you're going to hear later. Coach Kearns is the head of our legacy and leadership division of our foundation. And you guys are in for a real treat. He might be the one name on there that maybe not everybody's as familiar with. But I will tell you up front, he's probably going to be the best speaker you hear today. Okay, he does an amazing job, but he's the guy who organized all this, along with my wife, Ellie, who will be running around in a black foundation shirt. If you have questions today, okay, you can see anybody wearing the foundation logo. There's adults out there. There was gals checking in. You'll see myself, some of our other teachers and coaches around. Feel free to ask. Okay, feel free to ask. We want you to enjoy the day, to have a great time. At this time, we're going to do, we're going to try to do something. I had the opportunity to go to a, a leader cast conference um, and they were do, using all kinds of technology. And as a high school principal here at Applington Parkersburg, most days I have to fight you guys on your technology. Today we're going to encourage you to use it, okay? I don't know anything about it, so that's why Mark Reifenrath is going to come up, explain a little bit what we're after, what we'll hope you'll do. With this, understand um, that anything that's posted, you know, hopefully it'll represent us, this clinic, in a positive way. It'll represent your school in a positive way. But I'm going to have Mark, who's on our foundation board, he's going to talk to you about that. Then I'm going to come up, and I'm your first speaker, so we'll get started with the day's activities. You're going to get better from this point forward, guaranteed. Um, all right, take out your phones and connect to the network that is ETFF, all right? And then whatever you're on, if you're on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, go out, like us, favorite us, uh, follow us, whatever you got to do, all right? Throughout the day then, and I'll leave this up here for just a little bit longer, 
Throughout the day, when you have questions, you can tweet directly to us at our Twitter handle or post it on Facebook. Uh, so if you have a question with one of the speakers, we're going to try to compile those. We'll look for the best ones, for consistent ones, and then we'll get those to the speakers and have them answer. So uh, that's the way that you want to communicate today. If you see a, a quote that you really like, retweet it, post it, ask other schools for questions. We really want you to try to interact as much as you can. So the hashtag that we'll use, hashtag ETFF, try to put that on everything. And uh, you can also follow that. So if you know how to use that, you can see the string of everybody that's using that hashtag. You can see what everybody's saying. Um, uh, let's see here. Uh, so an example of how you'd ask a question. So you can just say, hey, at Ed Thomas FF, and then your question. All right? Any questions on that? I wasn't in any movies, all right? Um, so that's pretty much it. Make sure to follow us, and uh, we're going to have lots of opportunities for you to interact throughout that throughout the day. So uh, have a great day, and thank you. All right. All right. We thank Mark for that work. <laughs> Do ask when the when the speakers are talking. Use your best judgment. You know, don't be checking out everything that's going on in the social world. And we do ask that you pay attention. I think the beauty of this clinic is, the beauty of this is we took the best leaders from our school districts, or we took leaders who have potential. Maybe some of us haven't made the absolute best decisions yet. Maybe we're on the brink of really becoming the absolute best leader in our school that's going to have a positive impact and make a positive difference. But for each and every one of you young people, there is a reason you are here today. There is a reason... Your school said, hey, we're going to allow these kids go to get, become better leaders and have an impact in our community, to have an impact in our hallway. And I don't know each and every one of you individually, and I don't know why maybe you're here, but I guarantee you there is a specific reason that you are in that seat you are in, and I have a very high confidence level that you're going to hear somebody today, and you're going to hear something that's absolutely going to trick with you, and you're going to get it. And it's going to make you better. It might be me. It might be the next speaker. It might be the last speaker. It might even be a conversation you have at lunch a day. Okay? But there is a purpose and a reason you're here, and it's your opportunity. It's your challenge to make the most of it. I'm going to speak to you today. Every speaker is going to have a little bit different topic, different thing to hit on with leadership. My conversation today is going to be on leadership through adversity. Okay? That's going to be kind of everything I talk about. If you get nothing else, you remember Aaron Thomas, he talked on leadership through adversity. And you know, growing up, and I'm a reference quite a bit, when I grew up, I can honestly tell you, in third grade, I knew what I wanted to do with the rest of my life. In third grade, I knew I wanted to be, well, first I wanted to play in the NFL, and that one didn't go well for me. So my backup plan was, I wanted to be a teacher, and I wanted to be a coach. And I didn't understand why, but third grade, that's when I finally got to go to football practice with my dad, and my mother didn't have to be with me. It was the first time, I was on the team. Every Friday night, you'd find me ball boy. Number three, on my jersey, out there running around, I got to go to every practice. I rode the bus to every game. I was a very important piece of Applington Parkersburg football. Just ask me. Okay? I mattered. But what I got to notice is I didn't think my dad had a job in third grade. I didn't think he had a career. I thought he just really liked to go to the high school every day and hang out with high school kids. And I thought he liked to get up at 530 and go open the weight room. And I thought he liked to go out and mow the football field and do all those things. But he never stayed home from school. And he never once said, oh, I can't believe i got to go to school today. I can't believe I have to go to football practice when it's 100 degrees. He never said that. And one lesson I took from him, he always said, Aaron, you got to be ready because you never know when you're going to have an opportunity, and you never know when you're going to have a platform. And you got to be ready for those moments. And I always thought growing up, opportunities and platforms, those come from good things. If I work as hard as I can, if I'm a good person, if I do what I'm supposed to do, that provides me opportunities. When I was your age, if I got good grades, that put me on the National Honor Society. That was an opportunity. If I worked hard at my sports and I got in the weight room and I did what I was supposed to do, I had an opportunity, I had a platform to play, whether it be basketball, football, whatever it might be. But I had an opportunity and I had platforms. But I'm here to tell you, opportunities and platforms aren't always because of great things. My dad's first true national opportunity and platform, in 2005, we had four guys from Applington Parkersburg playing NFL football. And so my dad receives this award. He's the National High School Football Coach of the Year by the NFL. So my parents that year, they got to go to the Super Bowl. And I can tell you, growing up, son of an educator, my mom worked part-time here in town. We didn't have a ton of money. We didn't travel a lot. I think we left the state of Iowa maybe four times my entire youth. I got to go watch the Cubs play a couple times and the Twins play once. That was it. And so imagine the excitement for my mother to get to go to the Super Bowl that year. And of all places, she got to go to tropical Detroit in February. 
But while there, my dad had the opportunity to speak to a banquet with Hall of Fame football players, Hall of Fame coaches sitting in this room in a banquet hall. They said, you got 15 minutes to talk about whatever you want to talk about. You can talk football philosophy. You can talk about your four NFL guys. And my dad said, well, can I talk about what I'm most proud of? I said, 15 minutes. Keep it to that. He said, well, I'm going to talk about Parkersburg, Iowa. He said, because I think it's the most special place on earth. And I know I didn't put four guys in the NFL. It, because they came from good homes, where we have good teachers, and they learn the work ethic, and they learn to take pride in where they're from. So that's what he chose to talk about. Nothing about him. But that was his opportunity. We're going to fast forward now, May 25th, 2008. Our community was hit by an EF5 tornado. This school we're in was completely destroyed. Okay? One third of our students that day lost their home. So imagine a third of the students you're with here today no longer having a house. We had seven people in Parkersburg that day killed. We had one in neighboring New Hartford also killed. And they went through some of the same devastation, same de destruction. And all of a sudden, every major news network in our country is coming to Parkersburg, Iowa. My dad, being a community leader, somebody who had been here for quite some time, all of a sudden, he's doing every single interview. I ask you, was his opportunity and platform that day because of four NFL guys, because that he had done good things or had won games coaching or made a difference, had an impact in the classroom? Absolutely not. He was being talked to because he no longer had a home and he had, no longer had a place to work. But my dad's platform that day, his message was this. It wasn't, poor me, where am I going to live? How could this happen to us? His message that day was, hey, we're going to dust ourselves off. We're going to get ourselves up. We're going to move forward. Fast forward 13 months later, June 24, 2009. High school weight room, 22 young people finishing up lifting that day. We had some going to be freshmen, a couple going to be sophomore boys, and we had quite a few of our female athletes in there lifting. Former student walks in, fatally shooting my father seven times in front of 22 young people just like yourself. School shooting, national story. Every major network wants to get right back to Parkersburg. The guy who usually does the interviews, however, is no longer with us. Being the oldest son back to third grade, wanting to be just like my dad, my opportunity, my platform to speak on a national stage came from the absolute worst day of my life. I can tell you, I couldn't dream up the scenario of June 24, 2009. But I was prepared, and I was ready for my platform and my opportunity. How'd that happen? Because I had two amazing parents who raised me the right way, who disciplined me when I was your age, even though I didn't appreciate it, who made me be home at midnight for my curfew, and 12.01 meant I was going to be home at 11 o'clock the next night if I got to go anywhere. It was a platform as an opportunity through adversity, and I was prepared for that because I also grew up with, like I said, great parents. I had great teachers, and I had good friends and a support staff around me who believed in me and said, hey, we can overcome this. We can do that. So young people, I'm here to tell you today, your platform, your opportunity isn't always going to be because of our hard work and all the great things that happen to us. And as we talk leadership, I'm going to tell you this. Anybody can lead when things are going well. It takes zero leadership skills to be the captain of an undefeated football team, volleyball team. It takes zero skills to be the lead in the play or the musical when everybody knows their lines and we have a great production. It takes no effort to lead when we have great student um, camaraderie, our sense of community, our school prides at a high level. Where true leadership gets revealed is when we're faced with adversity. Because that's when leadership gets formed. I'll never forget, I was with my dad right after the tornado, and I was at Union High School at the time. I didn't even live here, work here. I came back to help. And we were loading up whatever football equipment could be saved. And there's this reporter from the Des Moines Register following my dad all around that day as we're trying to save all the football helmets and shoulder pads and all that stuff. And I'll never forget, we slammed the truck doors and we got equipment in the back of my dad's truck. I said, why do you keep doing all these interviews? We could have been done with this so much, we could have been on to the next thing. And he stopped, he looked at me, he gave me one of these. He said, Aaron, anybody can lead when things are going well. True leadership gets revealed when you're faced with adversity. He said, I've had things so easy here at Applington Parkersburg since 1975. And I said, this is what I stand for. Now that I finally had to go through something tough, if I all of a sudden say, poor me and change my tune, everything I said I stood for goes right out the window. So young people, I challenge you to think, am I truly a leader? Do I make a difference? Not when everything's going well. My question, I think the thing we need to look at and remember is this. You know, if we're behind in a game, what is my attitude? What is my leadership? Am I picking everybody else up, telling everybody, hey, let's get going? somebody fumbles or misses spike, whatever it might be, I'm encouraging them? Or am I the one all of a sudden pointing fingers? Geez, you got to make a play. How could you just fumble that? I'm doing my job. You need to start doing yours. 
Because great leadership, great, great leaders, what they do is when things go well, they praise everybody else. And when things are struggling, they take the blame. Anybody can lead when things are going well. True leadership, difference makers, they do it when things aren't easy. Because that's when, when everybody starts looking around. Who are we going to follow? Who's going to step up? And if you have a great leader, that person can bring everybody right back together. If you don't have that, then all of a sudden everybody wants to go do their own thing. And then all of a sudden everybody's pointing fingers at one another. So I challenge you, if you say you're a leader of your team, if you say you're a leader in your school, how do you handle it when things aren't going well? Anybody can lead when things are easy. You know, I don't think it takes any leadership whatsoever to get on Twitter and start talking bad about other people. It's cowardly. Cowardly. I can say whatever I want about you because I don't have to see you till tomorrow on, on a machine. And if I see my buddies doing it, well, then I'm going to favorite that or I'm going to retweet that because they did it. And if I do what they did, then maybe they'll like me more. You want to talk about leadership, get on there and say, hey, why don't you knock it off? The thing I don't get about the whole social media thing is this. How on earth, when we all represent the same school, the same communities, can we put out for the entire world to see negative thoughts about one another? Why on earth would anybody want to come join us? Hey, let's go to Applington Parkersburg where they talk bad about one another and they put each other down and they say this and they say this for all the world to see. That's not leadership. And my hope is we have people in this room that, that I'm speaking to the prior here, that choir, that you know these things, that it's never an issue for you. But I'm not certain that's necessarily the case. Now we're going to get into that first point, main point, leading through adversity. You know, in going through the 20, I had the 29 easiest years of life a person could ever have. I was raised in a two-parent home, love, supported, discipline, got done here at Applington Parkersburg. I had the opportunity to play in the state football championship game when my dad coached me. Best sporting experience I ever had. Played in the state basketball tournament, run the state track meet. Everything I thought mattered, I was able to have some success with. Then I had the opportunity to go on and play college basketball at Drake University. Got a free education. Got to go travel, got to go to the Bahamas, Barbados. Unbelievable experiences. Throughout my get done with that, my wife could have definitely married somebody a whole lot better than me, but she settled for me. I have three amazing kids. I got a great job, first teaching coaching job at Union High School. Had great young people there, coached in the state basketball tournament, was assistant principal athletic director. My life could not have been any easier. May 28th, tornado hits. I will tell you, on that day, I thought both my parents were killed in that. They weren't. It was an inconvenience for me. I had to come back and help and do those things, but it wasn't adversity. My first tough thing I ever had to deal with in my life was June 24, 2009, the day my father was murdered. And in going through that moment, there's a couple things that I learned that I'm going to share with you today. With, number one, I'm going to tell each and every one of you this. Every person in here, we are all going to lose loved ones. And we don't get to pick when or why or how. We do get to decide, though, how are we going to honor those people and how are we going to remember them? Are they going to live through us? Are we going to make them proud of what we're doing? Are we going to get stuck in those moments and let those tough moments define For me, I could have never moved past June 24, 2009. If I would have got bitter, angry, all those things, I'd still be in June 24, 2009. But nothing would change. The other thing I can promise each and every one of you is this. We're all going to go through things we do not ask for and we absolutely do not deserve. We may have people say things about us. We may someday lose jobs. You may have relationships go bad. Okay? You may be blamed for things you had no part of. You may go through some, even be abused. Okay? You don't ask for that. You don't deserve that. Unfortunately, you're the only person who gets to decide how you're going to respond to it. And we go through adversity... I think three things became extremely clear to me when I went through the tough things in my life. Number one, I believe this. That life is truly 10% what happens to us and 90% how we choose to respond. You see, I could feel sorry for myself and I could be bitter and I could be angry that somebody killed my dad. But I can be as mad as I want to be and nothing's going to change. I can be as mad as I want to be and my dad's still going to be gone. I can't change that. Okay? The only thing I'd be doing if I was bitter and angry, the only thing I'd be doing is cheating my three kids out of the dad they deserve. I'd be cheating my wife out of the husband she deserves. And those young people I get to work with here at AP and I get to coach this winter in basketball, they would not be getting the coach or the principal they deserve all for something I can't change. By responding in the manner in which our family did through losing my dad, I've been blessed with unbelievable opportunities. Our family got to go to the Arthur Ashe, or got to go to the ESPY Awards in 2010. 22 of us flown out to Los Angeles. Nicest hotels, nicest restaurants. My kids, they sit in the front row of a Cubs-Dodgers game. 
They get to go to the ocean. They go to Disney. All this for free. We go to the ESPYs, and I get an es their video shown to my dad on ESPN for our entire country to see. I get an ESPY award from Brett Favre. After the ESPY awards, they get every sports star you can imagine coming down talking to our family. Dwayne Wade, LeBron James, Drew Brees, every one of them right, coming down talking to us about my dad. Get done with that. A week later, I get a call from the New Orleans Saints. They invite my mother, brother, and I and our wives down to New Orleans. Put us up. First game, this was the year after the Saints won the Super Bowl. Flown down to New Orleans. Nicest hotels, nicest restaurants. Before the game, I'm in the Saints locker room. Sean Payton, Drew Brees. I'm down on the field for warm-ups. And then I sit up in a luxury box and watch the game on a Thursday. On a Monday that week, flown, or drive down to Kansas City, Arrowhead Stadium. Same deal. Locker room before the game on the field, sitting with the owner. Go to New York the next summer to pro promote the book. All because on June 24, 2009, the worst day of my life, how our family chose to respond. You see, young people, you're all going to have June 24, 2009. Hopefully you haven't experienced that. Some of you I know have experienced. But you have to make that decision. When this happens to me, what am I going to do about it? What am I going to do with it? You see, Mark Becker decided to take my dad when I was 30 years old. But he's not going to determine who I'm going to be the next 5, 10, 15, 20, 30, however much time i got left. I'm not going to get stuck in that moment. I'm not going to let that moment create who I am as a person. I'm going to dust myself off, I'm going to get myself up, and I'm going to move forward. And it's not always easy, and it's not that I don't think about it every day. And young people, I'd trade in the ESPY awards, I'd trade up having this conference here today, I'd trade up the places my wife and I have been able to travel when I've spoken, all to have my dad back with me. But it's not an option. So I challenge you, 10% what happens, 90% how you choose to respond. I think... The second thing to remember when we go through tough times is somebody out there always has it worse than we do. And that 100% includes me. See, I had a great dad for 30 years. Am I going to complain because I only had 30 years of a great father? And there's people who have no relationship with their parents that don't get along with their parents, that have split parents, whatever it might be. I was fortunate. See, my dad grew up the son of an alcoholic. First 18 years of my dad's life were not the same 18 years I got. When my dad passed away at 58, he never once had a drop of alcohol. Didn't make his life, childhood, any better, but it made mine an awful lot better. And I think young people, sometimes when we go through tough childhoods, maybe home isn't everything you want it to be. I challenge you with that. If your home's not what you'd like it to be, then what you need to do is make it better for your kids. Because I was fortunate, my dad was selfless. It wasn't about him. He was about making sure his kids had a better life than he had. And because of it, I've had unbelievable experiences. Had a teammate at Drake University, Dante Harris from Seattle, Washington. Dante grew up in foster care, not, not a foster home, foster care his entire life. Every basketball game at Drake, I had two parents sitting up at the NAP Center cheering me on. Win or lose, always tell me, great job, always there supporting me, taking me out to eat, all those things. At 30 years old, when I lost my dad, am I going to call Dante Harris a guy who never had a dad? Am I going to say, hey, can you believe somebody killed my father? Here's a guy who never had a dad. So in those tough days when we think poor us, I challenge you to look around find those other people in your schools, in your communities who have it a whole lot worse than you do. And those days when we think poor me, start counting your blessings and everything you've been blessed with. Because i got a feeling most people in this audience have a pretty good thing going at school, if not necessarily at home. Not poor me, but what kind of difference can I make? I think the last thing when we go through adversity is the greatest gift God's given us is the power to choose. And I think well, three things you choose every day that's going to make an impact. Number one, biggest decision you make every morning is what is my attitude for this day? When I, first thing, when you wake up in the morning, you get to decide what is my attitude for this day going to be? Is it an attitude, is I'm going to go to school and I'm going to get better today? I'm going to be the absolute best I can be? Or is it an attitude, oh, I can't believe... They're going to make me take a test. I can't believe I have to go there and get challenged with hard classes. I can't believe they expect me to actually show up on time to give a good effort and be the absolute best I can be. I want you to think about your attitude is going to impact every person you come in contact with today. It's either going to positively impact them or it's going to negatively impact them. And you get to make that decision. Are your comments going to make somebody's day better or is it going to make it worse? Because with your attitude, it's a simple thing. You don't need money for a good attitude. You don't need some fancy title for an attitude. You don't need to get straight A's to have a good attitude. All you have to do is make a choice. And you get to make a choice each and every day. 
After my father was killed, I was asked if I'd return and worked with Mr. Thompson, our school, on returning back to AP to take my dad's job. And one of the first tasks I had to do was go into my dad's temporary office over in Appleton when this new building just got built and get all his things and move it to our brand new high school. And that day I found this poem hanging up in my dad's office in Appleton. I know he hung this up because he knew one bad day of a bad attitude after that tornado was a green light for all our young people to have a bad attitude, for all the other employees, for our community to have a bad attitude. And I'm going to share this poem with you today. It says, Attitude. The longer I live, the more I realize the impact of attitude on life. Attitude to me is more important than facts. It is more important than the past, than education, than money, than circumstance, than failure, than success, than what other people think, say, or do. It is more important than appearance, giftedness, or skill. It will make or break a company, a church, or a home. The remarkable thing is we have a choice every day regarding the attitude we'll embrace for that day. We cannot change our past. We cannot change the fact that people will act in certain ways. We cannot change the inevitable. The only thing we can do is play in the one string we have, and that is our attitude. I am convinced that life is 10% what happens to me and 90% how I react to it. So it is with you. We are all in charge of our attitudes. I can't remember. I don't think that's in your book, but Charles Swindoll wrote this. If you want that poem, all you got to do is put in attitude, Charles Swindoll. It'll pop up on the internet. Your attitude, most powerful thing you get to choose each and every day because it's going to have an impact. I want you to think about who are the people you most like to associate with, you most like to be around. Who are the teachers in your building that you can't wait to get in their classroom? Why is that? I promise you it's the attitude they bring each and every day. They may not be having their best day outside of school, but you'd never, ever know that. Because they show up ready to work with a positive attitude. And as young people, you get to do the exact same thing. You can set the tone for your entire school by the attitude you embrace at the beginning of that school year. The beginning of each and every day. Bond, how do we treat each and every other person? The second thing I think you guys get to choose each and every day is how do you spend your time? Because you can verbally with words tell me what matters most in your life. You can stand up here and I can stand up here and tell you how important... You know, our school is to me and the, my three sons and my wife and, and whatever else that I say matters to me with words. But words take nothing to say. They're endless. They're free. They're cheap. I could stand up here all day and tell you what matters most. And you'll have no idea if that's actually true or not. If you want to see what really matters to somebody, I challenge you to look, where do they spend their time? Because we're only given 24 hours each and every day. And so if you tell me your academics are the most important thing to you, if I were to look and see where do you spend your 24 hours, would I see you then studying for every test? Would I see you turning in your own work on every single assignment? Would I see you going above and beyond if that's your most important thing? If you tell me, you know, sports or your fine arts or FFA or whatever it else you say you're passionate about, and you sit here and you tell me how important that is to you, if I were to look at where you spend your extra time, what would I see? Playing video games? On our phones? are doing those things that we say matter most. Don't tell me you're a great athlete and never show up to the weight room or get in and shoot on your own or work on hurdles or whatever it is. Because that doesn't matter to you. That's words. Okay? You show people 24 hours a day, you got to decide what are you going to do with that time. You know, that is this. Young people, I'll be honest, you, you can fool your teachers, your administrators, and even your coaches. Okay, you can fool. You can give us all the lingo, all the good thing. Oh, he sure is a good kid. Or she's a good kid. Monday through Friday could do absolutely 100% the right thing. Okay? You can probably even fool mom and dad. Okay? You can probably fool mom and dad thinking you're making good decisions all the time. I'm going to go on a limb and say you're going to have a real tough time fooling the people sitting beside you. They know who you really are. Not when just adults are around. Not just when coaches are around. You know, yeah, you'll give me all the lingo. You're my captain. You're doing this. You're at the leadership conference. And then Friday night after the game, you're going to be out partying, drinking, smoking, doing whatever. Saturday night, same deal. Tell mom and dad, hey, I'm going to go stay at so-and-so's house. It's not where we're at. Might fool mom and dad. Not going to probably fool your peers. The one person I promise you, you'll never, ever fool. When you get up each and every day and you look in that mirror, you will never, ever fool yourself. You can try to convince everybody else how great a leader you are. But when you get up each and every morning and you look in that mirror, you have to look at yourself and you know darn well if you're giving your absolute best or if we're a hypocrite. You know if what you're doing is the right thing and everything you're saying you proclaim. You know my favorite thing, we're talking uh, Twitter again. 
My absolute favorite. So I'll see these pictures and everybody's got Bible verses on their back, their second page when it says who they are in Bible. And then I'll look your first tweet and you're swearing up a storm and all this other stuff. Who are you? What are you? Or I'm bad-mouthing everybody else. But when we look in that mirror, we will never, ever fool ourselves. And you see, my father always defined integrity as this way. Integrity is doing what's right even when nobody else will see what you're doing. As a person of character, a person with integrity, if there's money laying there, do you take it if you know you're going to get away with it? Somebody leaves their locker open, hey, I, might, I need 10 bucks, I need 5 bucks. Or do you have the toughness, the strength to do what's right all the time? You'll fool a lot of people, but you'll never fool yourself and you're probably not going to fool your peers. But you get to decide what are you going to do with your time and where does that match up. The third thing, last thing you decide each and every day, I truly believe you get to decide your relationships. Do you care about other people? Or are you just in this thing for yourself? Oh, I'm going to be friends with them because I know they got a nice lake home and they got a nice house and I want to go to their basement and hang out and watch the big screen TV and play video games and all these things. And, and I want to hang out with them because they're, they're the cool kids and if I get to be with them, then, then that's going to make my life a whole lot better. And if that means I need to step on all these other people along the way and badmouth my true friends, then that's what I'm willing to do because I want to get ahead. You know, with relationships, I learned so much after my father was killed. My dad's visitation, we saw 4,500 people. His visitation went from 1.30 in the afternoon to 11.30 that night. Okay? And my dad's few, many of your schools, it wasn't too young then, they came and they supported and they lined the streets. And the reason that happened was not because he's a good football coach. There's all kinds of good coaches. It's because he cared about people. And young people, if you want to make a difference, if you want to be different than most people in our society today, then you find people not who have everything going smooth, but you find people who are down here a little bit and really struggling, and you grab them, and you pull them, and you take them with you. Because that's leadership. Anybody can lead the group that's doing what they're supposed to, going in the right direction, working hard, doing everything they're supposed to. You want to be a leader? You find those who are right on that fringe. About every other weekend, they're smoking marijuana, out drinking. And all of a sudden, you get them, and you pull them, and they're doing what you're doing now. That's leadership. That's toughness. That's caring for other people. You want to have a relationship, you want to care for one another, sometimes you've got to be able to look a friend in the eye and it's not a condescending, it's not a judgmental, but it's an open, honest, hey, you're better than that. You're better than that. We need you on our team. We need you in our school. We need you, whatever it is. But you try to get the best out of people, not tear people down, not put them down so you feel better about yourself. That's not leadership. It takes no special relationship to do that to other people. You see, I want you to think real quick as we near winter. Let's say we get home from a late activity at school, okay, and you're having to drive home, okay? Late at night, you didn't get your cell phone charged, you got just enough power to make one phone call, and all of a sudden you slide in the ditch. It's 20 below zero outside, snow's coming, it's late. Mom and dad, let's say they're not home, and you got to call one friend to come get you. One friend. Can everybody imagine one, so, one call left? Late at night, cold outside, who are you going to call with that one call? Everybody got that person in their mind who they call? More importantly, how many people would take that one phone call and they'd be calling you? That's what matters. That's what matters. Can people count on you? Can people trust you? Do they know you're somebody that's a difference maker that's there to help other people? Or are you just in this thing for yourself? Every day you get to pick your relationships. I hope they're meaningful, and I hope they're not just surface level deep but they make a positive impact. The last thing I'm going to talk to you about today, I often, so often hear young people, high school students tell me, oh, nobody cares what we think. We don't matter. And I'm here to tell you, I think that's 100% wrong. I think high school students, especially in small communities, are the most influential people in the entire community. Here's why I say that. I have three young boys at home. My oldest son, First time I got done with a high school basketball practice here, and he had to play a game up at North Butler. First, I think it was third or fourth grade scrimmage. I get home, my son's got black socks on, he's got shorts to here, he's got a sweatshirt, and he's got headphones on. I don't dress like that. Where do you think he learned that? By watching my high school guys. Who do you think he wants to be like, his dad, or like each and every one of you? Like each and every one of you. What becomes cool, what he sees you guys do when he comes up and watches the volleyball game, how our football guys act, that's what my son thinks is cool. That's what he's supposed to do. Young gals, how you dress, what you say, how you carry on, 
That's what each and every little girl at that elementary, that's what they think is cool. That's what they think is the way to do. You have no idea your impact on the young people in your communities. No idea. If you go out to your playgrounds, I guarantee you, they are being you when they're playing football, when they're playing basketball, when they're playing baseball. They are you. In, the, in, in my kids' eyes, our AP students are no different. They're on the same field as any Iowa Hawkeye, Iowa State Cyclone. They're on the same playing field as any Chicago Bear or Green Bay Packer. That's how much respect they have for you guys. And if you think it doesn't matter the language you use when you go into Casey's, or when you're in town and you're with your parents and you're disrespectful and rude, it gets noticed. It gets seen. And all of a sudden, that becomes the cool thing to do. That becomes our culture. You guys are the most impactful. Tell me one other thing, an adult activity that I can organize that could fill an entire football field, stadium, that could fill an entire gymnasium, or an entire auditorium. In our size of town, the answer is zero. People come do that because they want to see you. You say, oh, adults, they don't care what we think. That's not true. Because young people, I'm here to tell you, when you go out and you compete or you perform, you don't just represent the football team or the volleyball team. You don't even just represent Applington Parkersburg High School or Hudson High School or Clarksville or wherever you're from. You represent your community as a whole. And your community deserves your absolute best effort and acting in a first-class manner in everything you do. Because unfortunately, with a lot of our small schools, all anybody knows in the rest of the state of Iowa knows about our town is primarily how our extracurricular activities. Very few places know what businesses we have here. They don't even know how many people live here. But they can tell you if we have a different, decent basketball team, volleyball team, band, choir, football team, whatever. They also know, yeah, they're really good, but they act like idiots. Their sportsmanship is terrible. Because it's not just about winning. You'll be known as, oh, they win, but I would never want to live there. I would never want to be a part of that because how they act, how they treat one another. So young people, don't tell me you don't have an impact and you don't have an influence, you don't have a platform. I think at your age, you have the largest platform in your community over anybody else in that entire town. You, the young kids want to be just like you, and you represent the older people. How you carry yourself, how you compete, how you perform. You know, um, I'm going to give you a poem, and this one is in your book. It's towards the end of my section in there. And this is something my dad always used, and I can tell you, when I saw this, this has stuck with me, and this is something I never forget. And then I became a... And with my three boys, I promise you this is 100% true. And I challenge you, put this somewhere where you see it before you're going out publicly, especially if you're around little kids. That poem says, little eyes upon you. There are little eyes upon you, and they're watching you day and night. There are little ears that quickly take in every word you say. There are little hands all eager to do anything you do. And a little person who's dreaming of the day they'll be like you. You're the little person's idol. You're the wisest of the wise. And their little mind about you, no suspicions ever rise. They believe in you devoutly and, hold, and holds all that you say and do. They will say and do it your way when they grow up just like you. There's a wide-eyed little person who believes you're always right. And their eyes are always open and they're watching day and night. You are setting the example every day in all you do. For the little person is waiting to grow up to be just like you. And young people, that is a responsibility. That is something you cannot take lightly. That is something that was 100% true. And I promise you, if you think back to when you were a younger person, I guarantee you, you can think about who are the leaders in your community. Who is the high school person you want to grow up to be just like? So on those weekends when everybody's saying, hey, let's go out and do this and do that, you're going to think about those little eyes? Or are you going to think about yourself? Leadership is easy when everything's going smooth. True leadership takes the toughness to do what's right time. It takes being willing to stand up when things aren't going well. I'm going to show you a quick video to kind of conclude, and I'll come back with a couple of final thoughts. In this video, this is my father speaking about five months before he was killed. After the tornado, he had the opportunity, he went around and spoke a little bit at different places. He's at William Penn, that's where he went to college. And he's speaking to a group of young people. And I think his message, this two and a half minute clip, is why we have this foundation. So I want you to watch this, think about this. I'm going to come back, give you about 10 seconds, and then we'll let you know how our breaks are going to work today. 
Mr. Aldrich, you got that? There are a lot of you young people in here tonight, and I want to share one thing with you. I'm doing what I'm doing today and tonight because of an impact of, of my high school football coach, Jerry Dolly. And I carried him to his grave. But I don't know if I ever took the time to tell him what he meant in my life. You young people, take time. Think about who, who's helped you become who you are today. Take time to give them a call. If it be mom, if it be dad, if it be your high school coach, a grandparent, or send them a letter. Tell them, thanks for what you've done for me. You know, as a coach and as a teacher with you young people, we're not trying to just how to teach a science and math and history and how to play the game of football. They're trying to in some way make a difference in your life. That's why I do what I do today. I've looked at what I do as my mission field in life. God put me in Parkersburg, Iowa for a reason. Maybe this past year was a reason, I'm not sure. But I do know this. I'm in the greatest profession there is in this world, I think, because I get to work with young people like you every day of my life. And God willing, I'm going to be able to do that for a few more years, I hope. But I have a greater passion for what I do now because I realize my time is getting less. Young people, have a passion for whatever you do in life. Have a passion for what you do. And impact other people. I heard Lou Holtz talk out at Notre Dame and he closed that day with three questions and I'm going to close with those same three questions tonight. He said three questions to ask of yourself. Number one, do you care about other people? Number two, can people trust you? And number three, are you committed to excellence in every phase of your life? From your relationship to God to what you're gonna do as a profession. And you think about those three questions. That says a lot about the type of person you are. As I wrap up my session, I truly challenge you, take time to thank those people who make a difference and have an impact. That coach, that teacher, and don't send them a text, don't send them an email, hand write them a letter, you'd be amazed at what that means. Believe it or not, young people, your teachers and coaches could make a lot more money doing something else. They come to school every day because they want to see you become the absolute best you can be. That's why they do what they do. Okay? Thank them for whatever it is. Those, pers those people who've made a difference in your life, thank them for that. As I conclude, I truly hope this, that you're ready for your platforms and your opportunities, that you seek them out, that you pay attention to them. Number two, I hope that you have an attitude that makes every person around you better. That when you wake up each and every morning, you maximize each and every day, and you make every person's day around you better. And then finally, I challenge you to think about those little eyes that are on you and watching every move. You have an impact. You can make a difference. We're so grateful you decided to be a part of this first conference. Uh, Mr. Kearns, are you going to come talk on the break, or you want me to hit it? Okay. We thank you, Mr. Wigman's going to real quick talk to you on break on what we're going to do. Well, let's have a great day. God bless and thank you very much.